Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. So we're going to get this hair and makeup done. You got to give me a minute. It's, it's, it's exhausting. It is exhausting. Good morning, Family Church. How are you all doing this morning? Wow, that sounded the least enthusiastic I have ever heard. This morning, uh, I'll give you a minute, I'm going to be in Philippians 4, but this message is for, uh, look around in your row, and as long as there's more than five people, at least one of them, this message is for. Uh, If you're wondering how I know that number, you'll see in a minute. But this is for those of you who have been overwhelmed for so long that now you're just whelmed um, and everything is just a little bit crazy. If we all can please stand for the reading of the word of God, Philippians 4, starting in verse 4. And I need some help from the church on this one today. I think you guys know this. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. Oh, y'all, nope, we're going to start over. Rejoice in the Lord always. That was close. Again, I'll say it. Rejoice. There we go. Close enough. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. And right now you're already anxious on what I'm talking about. But in every situation, by by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And one more while we're there, uh, not while we're there, but in another passage, John 15, 7, this is Jesus speaking. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So this morning, I want to know what do you do when your anxiety is constantly assaulting your mind? When your mind is a mess and your thoughts are tormenting you all day, every day, what do you do when your mind feels like a prison? And in Philippians, Paul actually wrote that passage while literally in prison, which would have been a terrible situation, and yet he was fully relying and trusting on God to get him out. Enough to call us not to be anxious. And that is why I love the Bible, because these men and women in the Bible They go through situations much darker than ours, much more depressing than ours, way more drastic than ours, yet they fully trusted God, and they show us, too, how to trust in God. So, Lord, we thank you for the word that you have put in my heart today. I pray that it does not return void, and Holy Spirit, I ask you to invade this place even more and strike conviction in the hearts of those who need it. Amen. As you're being seated, the title of the message today is Surrender the Soundtrack. Surrender the soundtrack because you've got something playing on repeat in your mind that's tormenting you every day, telling you everything that can go wrong will go wrong. Everything that can fall apart will fall apart. Everybody that can leave your life is going to leave your life. All the bills, all the doctor's visits, but God is wanting you to surrender the soundtrack of suffering to the Savior. Surrender the soundtrack of worry to the only one who is worthy and he will renew your strength. Y'all might be nervous, but I am excited. If you remember last week, we heard the message on uh, Habakkuk chapter 2 entitled, Wait For It. Um, I guess this might sound a little bit similar because, as you know, patience is a virtue that none of us possess in the fullest capacity. And uh, a lot of anxiety does not come from thinking about the future, but wanting to control it. And actually, uh, in the sake of transparency, this is not the the message that I intended to bring this morning. Uh, I had something completely different in mind. And Wednesday came down, and I sat in my office and looked and started to type, and it was just like a brick wall. And uh, so I was like, well, uh, I'm not stupid enough to keep trying to push back against the Holy Spirit when he's telling me that's not what you're saying this week. So I was like, okay, we'll find something else. And I started getting a little bit anxious (laughs) because it was Wednesday. And I was like, okay. And I actually, I was scrolling through my notes of ideas that I had written down. And this message, I actually started writing this in January of this year. And the same thing happened. I started writing it and then hit a wall. So obviously, God was telling me then that the time was 
wasn't right. And he wanted me to wait, wait for it. Thank you. Somebody's right on pace with me. Woo, we're good. We'll, we'll preach the house down together. So, yeah, I was, uh, I was anxious about not, not finishing it. And if you remember, I made the joke a few minutes ago about the one in five on your row that this message is for. So just a couple statistics on anxiety. Anxiety disorders are the most common, and this is verbatim when I copy this down. So if this upsets you, blame Wikipedia or chat GPT or something. I don't know. <clears throat> anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the U.S., affecting nearly 20% of the population. So in a church this size, there's at least 70 of you who are dealing with something to do with anxiety. That number is probably significantly higher, given the state of uh, the country and the world right now. Young people are more likely to experience symptoms of anxiety than older adults, with nearly 50% of those between the ages of 18 and 24 reporting depressive disorder or anxiety problems. What this screams to me is that we have a whole lot pro more problems than we have prayer. <clears throat> and women, <laughs> don't get triggered, women, <laughs> women are more, more than twice as likely than men <laughs> to experience an anxiety disorder. And just to break the ice a little bit with that, I looked up the uh, Huffington Post, and I'm not endorsing them at all, I don't know anything about them, but they gave... <laughs> The ultimate list of things that cause anxiety. Number one is when Tanya screams out uncalled for. Oh, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm in a good mood today, y'all. Number one is when your phone, they wrote down when your phone is at 1%. I can guarantee y'all, y'all get an anxiety when that thing's at 50%. Uh, <laughs> number two, stepping into Forever 21. I don't know <laughs> if anybody's been in there. That store is insane. Number three, for all my introverts, arriving at the checkout section of Costco. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, repeat, oh, I'm sorry. Number four, repeating things that people just said. This is me. And uh, I actually, I saw this video this week of a guy, I think they were in Walmart, and the guy walks up to someone else, and he's like, uh, telling him a joke. He said, what do you call a dog without fur? I don't know if anybody has seen this. He's like, I don't know. And then he says... Chili bean potatoes. Exactly. And the guy laughs. And he's like, you get it? He's like, yeah, I get it. I get it. And the guy's like, all right, explain it. And you could watch this man's soul leave his body immediately. He was like, ugh. And the, it, it, it went off like three minutes that he's trying to explain the joke. Just tripping over himself. He starts like looking around like for a lifeline or something. Like it was, you know, whatever that millionaire show was. And finally, the guy that was filming, he was like, hey, man, it's, it's not supposed to make sense. And that is a lot of the, uh, like the things that we deal with anxiety that none of it makes any sense. Uh, a couple more things. Sunday nights, for those of you that hate your jobs, public restrooms, especially gas stations, picking an outfit. Uh, I'll tell you, probably the ones that deal with that the most are women and pastors. <laughs> Debating on whether or not to speak up, having to respond to texts. Realizing, see, I, I feel this one. Realizing you may not have the money when you swipe your debit card. Because I don't know the password to the bank account. I've given it to you. I don't, it's not there. She was lying. It's not there. I've, I've been at the store. Uh, this was a real big problem when I was working at Musgrove because my, my check would auto draft into our billing account, not our checking account. So I would go to swipe something, you know, and they're like, oh, sir, it's declined, which is a Always the worst that you'll ask. I swear there's money in there. I swear. And, uh, and then it got to the point I couldn't log in. I, fr I, fr I literally locked our account one time, actually several times, it, <laughs> several times because I didn't know the password to transfer money over. So now I don't have rights to our bank account. I just, <laughs> just I text Kelsey. I'm like, hey, can you transfer some money? That's right, baby. <laughs> uh, a couple more reading messages. Reading messages that you sent while drunk. This is family church. Y'all don't have to act like you didn't do none of that before. And picking something for dinner. That's got to be like the men because the women are always like, what do you want to eat? And you're like, I don't know. And they say, I don't know. You pick. And then you pick. And they're like, anything but that. <clears throat> and I don't want to nose dive this sermon completely, but... Those are all funny, but anxiety, how do these sound? Am I about to lose my job? 
Are we really going to get a divorce? Am I still pregnant? What if I die and don't go to heaven? Do they even like me? (laughs) Will I even make enough for the mortgage this month? Am I ever going to love myself? And am I going to win this battle? See, it is too easy to wander around in your worry. And we start to walk around and wander around aimlessly because we have too, anxi- too much anxiety to accomplish anything in life. And whether, whether it is worry about an outcome of a situation or not having enough resources, you need to understand that God is able to do far more, exceedingly more, than we ask, we think, or we imagine. His infinite ability exceeds our insufficient imagination. That's a mouthful. Because we don't know all the facts, but God does. We are not omniscient. God is. We're not omnipotent. God is. We're not omnipresent. God is. So this means that he knows everything about your situation. He is in control of your situation. And he is already in your tomorrow. He's already in your next week. He's at the end of your next month. He's at the next job promotion that you have at the end of your financial burden or whatever you're expecting him to do. He's at the finish line of your fear and your faith. And while you are worrying, he is working. But not only is he working, he is also Waiting, waiting for us to surrender the soundtrack of our anxiety to him. Because we don't really worry about tomorrow or today as much as we worry about tomorrow. When you wake up, you're generally not anxious about what is immediately happening in the present. You're always what's going to happen in the future. Is that, is that exam, am I going to flunk the exam that I'm about to take? Is my business uh, proposal about to go straight down the toilet? Am I going to lose my job? Are we going to get the divorce? Everything is usually anxiety about the future. And I think we, we worry because we put too many limitations on our Lord. Because just because we think that we can't do it in our own strength, we begin to believe that suddenly God can't speak a single word and move a mountain. He can't speak to our stronghold. He can't slay our giant. And we often forget God until it feels like he's forgotten us. If you need something to write down this morning, disconnect leads to discomfort. Because when we get disconnected from God, we begin to feel the suffering of not being in tune to his spirit. And notice, notice when you don't stay in your Bible consistently or your prayer life isn't being uh, consistent, it starts to get a little bit more chaotic in your life because you have began to neglect and move yourself outside of his covering. Consistency lessens the chaos because of God's covering. And that is why, point number one, we need to remain in him. John 15, 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you. God's voice, Jesus's voice is greater than all. So this means his word is greater than all. And we worry when his words are not in us. Remain means to continue unchanged, to stay in the same place or with the same person. So this is why you need to remain in Jesus. You need to excuse me, remain in his word until his word remains in you. Replace your screen time with scripture time. And another definition of remain to means to be a part, not destroyed, taken or used up. So when we remain in Jesus, when we remain in his words, there is no weapon formed that can prosper against us. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. There's nothing that can pierce through his protection over our lives. The enemy will throw accusation after accusation to assault you with anxiety, and he will get you to question what you are doing. He will get you to wonder, where is God? God, are you even here? He will get you to wonder, where is God in your story? Is he even with you anymore? He will get you to stand in church and ask, what are you even doing there now? What are you there for? God doesn't love you anymore. Do you remember what you just did last night? Do you remember how you screamed at your kids on the way to church right now? What are you even there for? But what you need to do is look back at the devil and say, oh, devil. But the Bible has another therefore that you can throw in his face. And it goes a little bit like this. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And if I am free from death, if death has no sting anymore, neither does the devil. 
You can throw it at me all you want, but I know whose side I'm on. I know who is the winning side. I know how this battle will end. I know who is meeting me at the end of my struggle. I know who's meeting me at the end of my suffering. I know who is meeting me at the end of my story, and it is the one who is coming in on a white horse, the only one that is worthy. He is the lamb that was slain, the alpha and the omega. He is the one who lifts you up in due time, and you are not condemned anymore because your creator has already called you he's already chosen you and with his words remaining in you you no longer need to worry because when you remain you will remember and David wrote down in Psalms 106 a little bit of something about remembrance for Israel he wrote down remember our fathers when they were in Egypt did not consider your wondrous works They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love, but rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. They forgot. They forgot what God had done. And we so often do the same exact thing. And if you notice, I know it wasn't on the screen, but he doesn't say, remember the abundance of God's laws. He wrote, remember the abundance of God's love. Because when you remember God's love for you, it will shift your focus. It will remind you not to worry so much because whatever you're going through first has to pass through his hand before it comes to you. And if you're going through it, God will be in it with you. And if he is in it with you, nothing can destroy you. That's why you need to remember it. Remember that he is working it out for your good. He is working it out for the purpose he has placed over your life. And how do you remember something? You retain it. So close. You retain it. This means you retain his words. And I don't mean any disrespect to anybody that's a lawyer, but those expensive people that you have to help hire, that you retain them to protect you and defend you when you need a little help defending yourself, or just even the fact that you don't know how to defend yourself because the law is insane. When you hire a lawyer, oh, I love this. When you hire a lawyer, it's called a retainer. Retainer (laughs) is the act of retaining one's service to keep possession of, to continue to use. Having a lawyer on retainer means you are guaranteed that they will take up your case. It might take a little bit longer than you would like, and you're definitely going to spend a little bit more money than you intended to in the beginning because you might have thought that it was just going to be a one and done, sweeping under the rug type of situation, and you didn't have to expect to keep working at it. You didn't expect to have to keep digging things up from your past that you saved for just in case. And you keep waiting for God to split the sea, but you're also forgetting that you still have to walk in between the walls of the water that could come crushing down and destroy you. But that water is not meant to destroy you. It's meant to deliver you. And just as much as it's meant to deliver you, it is meant to drown your enemies. And all that suffering in the past that you thought in the moment was going to kill you, but you held on to it for some unknown reason until the day came that you needed it, you retained it. And you had it filed away in the back of the filing cabinet collecting dust. You had that album called Screenshots. And you, you had that sucker saved in the back of your mind so you could slap it down like an Uno reverse card and show them that just because they think they had ammo against you, they didn't realize that you have the anointing around you. And the devil didn't realize that you didn't just have an album called Screenshots. You've got a heart full of scripture. And the enemy, the enemy is always going to come at you to accuse you to recount your past and to try to stop you on your path to your purpose. But you just remind him that just because your present might look a little pathetic, your condition is not your conclusion. Your faith is in your future. And the devil, I don't know if you know this, the devil doesn't have a future that looks too good. And you have been remaining in the word. You've been remaining in your salvation. And just like you paid a price for protection from a lawyer, there is one who paid a greater price for your protection. And your redeemer is on retainer. Your redeemer is on retainer. He will take your case. He will provide your protection. He is guaranteed to work on your behalf for your good. He will be there when you need it. He will give you exactly what you need in the moment that you need, in the season that you need. When you remain in him and when you ask him which means you request from him when your redeemer is on retainer you can ask whatever you wish you can request it but is it this is where we get tripped up is it his will or is it your will 
Are you praying for your salvation? Are you praying for a new sports car? Are you praying for a new house? Because you want more money, but that comes with more problems. And maybe you just want a big fat bank account, but you don't really want to be able to bless anybody with it. Is it his will or is it your midlife crisis? Is it Christ or a new Corvette? Which one are you speaking to more, Christ or your crisis? Is it his will that just like we heard about Joshua a few weeks ago, that your battle is lengthened so that you learn to trust him more and lean on his strength, lean on his understanding to trust in his purpose more? Is it his will that we quit worrying about what we're going to eat and drink every single day, which is us worrying about working to make our own provision instead of trusting in his provision? And I am not saying to go and quit your job and be a lazy bum and just expect God to rain manna down on your dinner table. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul warns about idleness because the people were becoming lazy in their work. And they thought Jesus was coming so soon that they just quit working. And they started to uh, take advantage of the church's generosity. I am talking about praying and believing God to truly meet your needs, not just your wants, the things you need for growth, for survival, for spiritual growth, things to flex your faith and make sure that you do not become spiritually stagnant or abandon your faith because our prayers are not productive when we are not present with the provider. And what's worse, the prayers are not productive when they're not even being produced. Prayer and praise are the pathway to peace. And I think this is why Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. Do not be anxious over anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and God's peace will guard your hearts and minds. And too often prayer is the last resort instead of the first line of offense, not defense, offense. I don't get why we wait for the attack before we seek more anointing, why we wait for the suffering before we start seeking his spirit. We have got to get back on the offense. Peter's, or, yeah, Peter says, resist the devil and stand firm in your faith. That's not passive to me. That's not passive to me. We just keep waiting and waiting and waiting and we've become too idle. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. And we have been giving the kingdom keys to the kingdom. And the gates of hell cannot overcome us. And I think this is why it's so important that we remain with Jesus, remain in Jesus daily. Because he is not just your creator. He is the savior, the sustainer, the redeemer, and the provider. Jesus told us himself, don't be anxious. And he drove it home by saying, look at the birds how they're cared for. Look at how the flowers grow. Look at how the grass grows and is there one moment and it's gone the next. Look around at creation and look at how much just the little things are cared for and realize how much more does God care about you than those things? How much more will he clothe you? How much more do you matter to God than those things? And Jesus was speaking against anxiety and the worry that shows a lack of faith in him. Because he is the good shepherd. He is the one that will leave the 99. He is the way maker, the miracle worker. And when you don't see it, he's still working. That's not just a fun line in the song. That's talking about who God is. This is why we always rejoice. Because we know who he is, what he is, and what he does. This is why the world will never have true peace. They'll never understand just how it is that we rejoice always. Because it's peace that passes understanding. And the devil has blinded their hearts to the reality of who God is. This is how we have a joy that lasts even during our trials and our suffering. We rejoice by retaining and recalling on his goodness, on his faithfulness, on his nearness, on his promises, on his love, and on his protection. We gain strength in our suffering by remembering just who our Savior is and all that he has done, all that he is doing and all that he will do for our good. Joy is more than emotional happiness. That's what the world gets. Emotional happiness that depends on outward circumstances. It makes you happy when you have food in your fridge. It makes you happy when your car starts or you have gas in the tank. It makes you happy when you get the kids to school on time. It makes you happy 
and joyful when there's no traffic, which means you're probably not that happy anymore in good old St. Augustine. It's joyful when you get a bonus check. But if you tie your joy to your job, you're going to lose your joy if you lose your job. You can't tie your happiness into circumstances or you will be crushed when chaos comes into your life. Because true joy is based on God's immeasurable love for us. It is based on the peace and hope for what Jesus has done for us and what we know is coming in our future. I don't need joy tied to my circumstances. I need joy tied to Jesus Christ. Don't put your joy in junk. Put your joy in Jesus. Joy is knowing that he died for your sins and rose again so that you will have eternal life through him and with him. Joy comes from knowing about his forgiveness. It comes from knowing from just how close he is in all your circumstances. Joy in Jesus will provide you with the motivation for your purpose. And this is why we rejoice. This is why we're told to not be anxious about anything. Because anxiety and worry are the exact opposite of faith. Worry is the false faith in things that we haven't exactly prayed for. And that stings, but maybe it's just because we have said some words, but we have tried to still hold on to it instead of releasing the responsibility to God. Anxiety is just attempting to handle situations in ways that are different than God has desired you to. I have something here to show you, just a fun little uh, illustration, and forgive my uh, Ted Bundy handwriting. I'm going to hold this up. This is... Anxiety, the literal word anxiety. What is at the center of it? I. I I is at the center of anxiety. I am trying to do this. I don't know if I'm going to make it. I don't know if I'm going to have enough money. I don't know if I'm going to survive the situation. I don't know if God is going to show up in this house. I don't know if my husband is going to make it to church on time because I think that he slept at someone else's house last night. I don't know how my kid is going to get off of these drugs. I, 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 I. You know what else is at the center of? I. Pride. Pride. We get so much anxiety trying to stay in control. But you can't be a Christian and have control. You have to make the decision every single day to depend on God for everything, in every situation, to follow his guidance because where he guides, he provides. Prayer puts the power back in God's hands. Prayer gives purpose to your faith. Prayer is the intentional release of a situation into the Savior's hands, knowing that he is going to come through for you, knowing that he is going to lift you up, knowing that he is going to provide for you, knowing that he is going to make a way because he cares for you. Anxiety is waging a war on your mind with worry so that you're too weary to walk. And if you're too weary to walk, you're too tired to think. And if you're too tired to think, you will be too spent to speak. And if you're too spent to speak, you're going to end up believing the enemy when he tells you that your situation is too pathetic to pray about. And you will end up suffering in silence instead of speaking to the Savior about your situation and understanding that all your situation needs is one word from God to breathe life into you, to breathe life into your situation. All you need is that one scripture, that one thing that you can remind God of that he has already done. That way you will remember if he did it back then for them, he will do it again for me. Again and again and again and again. Just because... Just because we are called not to be anxious does not mean that you're not susceptible to the enemy's attacks. He is always going to attack you. Welcome to the club of Christianity. It's not easy. I don't know who lied and told you it was going to be easy. If anything, it's harder. But narrow is the way. Narrow. Hell's gates are wide open till they're not. And that's only when you're in there or not wanting to get in there. (laughs) He will continue to attack you because he doesn't want you to believe that God is greater than the giants that you are facing in your life. He wants you to fall into the deception that God can't or he won't diminish your depression, that he won't diminish your situation, that he won't diminish your anxiety. 
He wants you to believe that whatever you're facing now is something that you're always going to face, that you're never going to overcome it, that it's always going to be a struggle, that you're never going to be free of it. He wants you anxious. He wants you so full of anxiety that you will forget your anointing. He wants you anxious, not anointed. He wants you full of worry so that you will not remember that Jesus deemed you worthy of the sacrifice that he paid to save you from the the devil, to save you from sin. This is why it is so important that we remain for your requests for more anointing can be fulfilled. So your requests for more favor can be fulfilled. So your request for God to show up in your situation can be fulfilled because he wants to restore you. He wants to renew you. He wants to unleash his blessings upon you. He wants your cup to run over. He doesn't want you stuck in lack. He doesn't want you stuck in laziness. He wants to restore you 30, 60, 100 fold. He doesn't want you living how you are living now. He doesn't want you assaulted by anxiety anymore. Are you ready to remain in him though? Are you ready to retain his word in your heart and follow his will for your life? Are you ready to retain him so that you can receive what he has for you. Paul tells us in this passage to present our prayers with thanksgiving. And thanksgiving will transform your prayers. It is no longer looking at your problems, but looking at God and his possibilities. Thanksgiving stops the anxiousness and transforms it into assuredness. It reminds you of God's faithfulness. It reminds you if God was faithful then, he's faithful now, and he will be faithful in your future. It's never going to run out. Anxiety, and I don't mean this in a calloused way, it's really just a waste of time because it is killing you internally. It is killing you from the inside out. When I told Kelsey what I was preaching on, anxiety, she said, find what breaks the cycle. Find what breaks the cycle for the chronic Anxiety, And I think that's what Paul is trying to tell us. Being thankful. Being thankful. See, uh, when Mary and Martha came to Jesus because Lazarus died and Jesus goes to resurrect him. um, Make sure I don't get the name right. Mary. Sorry, Martha gets anxious. She gets anxious. Jesus shows up and Martha has anxiety. And she was like, it's going to smell. Don't open it. Jesus said, roll the stone away. She said, it's going to smell. And he says, remove the stone. Lord, by this time, there will be an odor. And Jesus doesn't even break a sweat. He's like, I already told you, move that stuff. Move that stone. You are about to see the glory of God. And she's worried about the smell. And Jesus saying, I told you to move the stone. So don't worry about the smell because Lazarus is about to come stepping out of this thing. And the first sentence in the prayer that Jesus prays. Before calling Lazarus out, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I thank you. He prayed first with thanksgiving, and it was gratitude that turned back the grave. By bringing everything to God in every situation with thanksgiving, he will lift you up. He will change you. Prayer with thanksgiving will allow you to let go of something that is tormenting you for all your life that you're still holding on to, and it will place it at the feet of the the one who is ready to make the trade with you and transform you. The more you pray to him about it, the less anxious you will be about it because he has a promise for you to receive. We heard it. That promise in verse seven is peace. The promise is peace that passes all understanding, peace that transcends all understanding, peace that transforms you and removes the torment from your mind and replaces it with his outpouring of love. This is the peace that lets you walk through the valley and know that he is with you, knowing that you will get through to the other side. This is the peace that lets you walk into a courtroom and know that God's outcome for your life, his will for your life is greater than any situation that you've already made up in your head. This is the peace that lets you look at all the bills that are sitting on your kitchen table, wondering how you're going to get food there, but you still trust in God to provide. This is the peace that is the only way that you can lay your head down at night, knowing that your child is out on drugs, maybe driving around drunk. This is the only thing that can give you peace, knowing that God has a plan and he has a purpose that he is working out. You've just got to trust his process and it doesn't sound fun. But this is God's peace. It is perfect. It has power. And it passes, as we said, all understanding. And what does it guard? 
It guards your hearts and your minds in Jesus. The devil is after your mind. Because if he can get anxiety in your head, he will get fear in your heart. But there is one who is greater than all. There is one where true joy comes from. There is one where true peace comes from. And not only does he stand at the door and knock, I believe he stays there to guard. God's peace is like a bouncer at the door, checking all the IDs of everybody that's trying to come in. Joy, come on in. Gentleness, come on in. Love, you're a little late, but come on in. Kindness, you're good. And not only is he letting the good ones in, he's keeping the bad ones out. Fear, you're not welcome here. Depression, so long. Goodbye, bitterness. How about regret? No, you're not on the list. Remorse, I don't think so. Anxiety, see you later. You're not allowed to come in here. Goodbye, shame. Goodbye, sin. Goodbye, deceit. Goodbye, devil. You're too full of lies to come into this house. You're not welcome in this space. It's already full of the Holy Spirit, and we don't have any capacity in here for your chaos. It sounds so simple, though, and we still struggle with it. We still struggle with trusting God. And Peter reminds us in another way what to do with anxiety. And I don't know about you, but this confirmed it for me today. This is literally today, May 5th, 2024. This is the scripture of the day on your Bible app. And I had my baby jump in my spirit when I saw that notification come up on my phone this morning. First Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And real quick, verse eight, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around. You just got to believe me that it's there. It's in there. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Leave that up for a second. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion. He gives you a warning when he is in your area. He doesn't just show up unannounced. There's always something that points to him and looking for someone to devour. I want you to notice that as the devil is looking for whom he can devour, God is looking for whom he can deliver. But back to verse seven, when I see cast all your anxiety on him, it makes me think of fishing because Peter wrote it and he was a fisherman. And way back before that, In John 21, they're going out fishing again on the boat. This is after Jesus has already been resurrected. And they've, you know, this is the second time. This is not the first time when Jesus called them. This is the second time. They fished all night the first time. They didn't catch anything. And Jesus told them to put the net down again. And Peter was worried that it wouldn't work, but he was willing to trust in Jesus. Even before he knew who Jesus was. So now in John 21, they're fishing and he's about to do the same miracle, but pay attention to the wording. He says, I'm going out to fish. Simon Peter told them and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Next verse. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Next verse. (laughs) He called out to them. Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. And he said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Leave that up for one moment. Can you imagine? Because they didn't know it was Jesus. And so you've been fishing all night and you have caught nothing. And this guy is screaming to you from the shore. Hey, just throw it on the other side of the boat. You would be like, oh, thank you. Good advice. We were throwing it over there. That's why it didn't work. Surely the the three to six feet is what's going to change everything. I mean, there's no fish. They can only be in this section of the pond, not this section. (laughs) Throw your net on the right side. Can you imagine that? I mean, honestly, some of y'all are uncomfortable laugh because it's talking about Jesus. He's got a sense of humor, too. You know, throw it on the right side. Oh, of course. Thanks. Samsonite. I was way off. And, uh, they, they, but they follow his advice. And they catch a large number of fish. And then they realize it was Jesus. And the left side wasn't working. So they threw it on the right. 
They surrendered their pride and listened, this time immediately. There was no other question. They just did it. But the left side wasn't working. So they threw it on the right side. And if you can, Kelsey, you can turn the lights down. Just close your eyes and reflect on this today. You've been trying to do it your own way. And you've been holding on to something for years and years and years. And you've prayed about it and you've cried about it and you've screamed about it. But have you actually fully surrendered it to God? Have you surrendered your soundtrack in your mind to the Savior, fully letting go and trusting in his will on his timing for him to lift you up? Because the left wasn't working and neither is your way. And you're worrying about it and not praying about it isn't going to change the situation. You're worrying about it and trying to control it isn't going to change the situation. And they threw it on the left and it wasn't working. So they listened to Jesus and they threw it on the right and they received exactly what they were looking for. And today you think maybe that you've tried it all and you haven't fully submitted to God. Maybe you've been complaining too much instead of being content. Maybe you haven't truly tried Thanksgiving yet and gratitude and appreciation. Maybe just a little more appreciation will stop the cycle of your anxiety. Appreciating what you have, what he has already given you and what he has on the way for you. And you've got one option left. And that is to do what is right. Throw it at his feet, drop the net of anxiety and pull up peace, pull up joy, pull up his grace, pull up his mercy, pull up gratitude, drop anxiety and pull up his love for you. It is a peace that passes understanding. I think to stop your cycle, you need to focus more on the Christ to pray with thanksgiving in every season, in every situation. Rejoice and say it again. Rejoice, remaining in him so you can request of him. And in due time, he will lift you up and you will receive it from him. To lay it at his feet, to surrender your soundtrack, to let your savior strengthen you and give you peace. And this morning, if you want a peace, that passes all understanding, but you've been crushed by the weight of your sin. And you're wondering, what the heck is that guy even talking about? Because everything in my life has been chaotic, it seems like, from day one. And I've tried to let things go, and I've cried myself to sleep about it every night. And then I go to work with a smile on my face trying to just get through it and make another day, but I'm ready to kill myself. I can't stand this anymore. I don't even know if I believe this anymore. I don't know if I even believe in Jesus because I've never seen him in my life. Maybe you're one of those people who's wondering how a loving God can let things seemingly go so wrong. And what you're not understanding is he's trying to show you what is right. That he's trying to draw you in and show you that your way is not the right way. There is only one way. And his name is Jesus. And he died for your sins and he rose again. And the devil is after your heart and your mind. And God has a peace to protect you, to guard you in that. And I think too often we're, we're trying to tie our joy in our seasons of what we think is good into not our hearts and our minds, but our bodies. We think if our bodies are suffering, that God is not with us. God would love to heal your body. He healed plenty of people. He made the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, the mute speak. But today... What he is after more is to guard your heart and your mind more than your body because this body will pass away and you will get a new one, one that is immortal, 
one that can never have any sickness, any disease, no problems. The perfect version of you that was always supposed to be the one that existed. And if you're wondering today, how do I get a part of that? How? How do I, how do I receive that? Is this Jesus real? And you've been throwing the net on the left side for far too long. And you've only got one option to throw it on the right side, to try it a different way, to try it the true way, to try the truth. And if that is you this morning and you're ready to receive the peace that passes understanding and you're ready to receive eternal life, I want us all together for the, for the goodness of those who are coming to God maybe for the first time or coming back to God corporately as a house to say this prayer. And I know I say it every time. It it is not a magical prayer. It's not a get out of hell free card. It is a chance for you to apply the Bible to your life and to believe in your heart and to confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. To repent from your sins and turn away from them and chase after him. And if that is you today, As we all say it together, church, repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent your son to die for my sins. I thank you that he rose again to give me eternal life. Jesus, I thank you for your blood that washed me clean. And now I'm white as snow. Jesus, I make you the savior of my life. The Lord of my life. And I will follow you all of my days. Amen. And if that is you, church, if that is you, you have given your heart to God for the first time. Or if you are coming back, there is a party in heaven for you. There is a party going on. And there is peace that is coming into your life, flooding in. There is anointing that covers you. There is protection that covers you. And if you're trying this and you've been hurt before and you've been church hurt, know that Jesus doesn't just instantly transform you. It is a lifelong process. We're all sinners. We all fall short. We all stumble. And until we kick the bucket and meet him up in the clouds, we're going to keep falling short, but he acts as if we don't. Jesus died as if he sinned so that we can live as if we didn't. And in a minute, they're going to play a song. And if you need prayer, altar workers, you can come forth. There will be someone up here to meet with you. And if you gave your life to Jesus, we would love to pray with you. If you need a Bible, we'd love to give you a Bible. But as they worship one more time, realize and reflect that we need to remain in Jesus. We need to retain his words. That we need to thank him for all that he has done for our lives. And this morning, just know that he loves you more than anything, more than anyone. He loves you. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.